the book of Job today, here in our little bear's room of discipline. We call it the bear's cave of discipline, the bear's house of discipline, but it's a place of discipline, both the discipline of steel and the discipline of the Word of God. We are in Job 27. If you've been tagging along with us in the book of Job, you know that Job has been faced with many uh, verbal dissertations to challenge his ethics, his morals, and his faith in Yahweh, Elohim, Jehovah. The one true God. So we begin. Job continued his discourse, saying, As God lives, who has deprived me of justice. We probably all thought that at some point in time or another, whether you are Christian or non-Christian. But understand this. God is fair. And none of us deserve the forgiveness that Christ offered on the cross by giving himself up to be beaten to death and hung on a cross to be strangulated by the sheer collapse of his muscles and arms and feet and chest. Christ gave that to us out of an act of love and mercy and forgiveness. We do not enter that until we receive him. None of us deserve it. Nobody deserves to teach the word of God. Nobody. But it's by the grace of God that he has allowed those that do and Mr. Bear it is the mercy of God, the grace of God. But as you've received, received that mercy and grace, then you must pick up your pack and move on. You must shed the sins of the world, shed the sensual sins, shed the sins of jealousy, anger, hatred, drunkenness, all the, the foolish things of the world. They must be shed so you can move on in maturity and then you start to shed the little things. Job, his core man, his core being was challenged by so much initially, physically, financially, emotionally, and now his faith is being challenged by his friends. And take this into account, no matter what Job, wherever you think Job is at, at the end of Job, God gives Job a thumbs up. God never convicts Job of sinning with his mouth. God put Job through the fire for us. So that the little tests in our life are nothing compared to what he endured. So, he believes that at this point in his life that he's been deprived of justice. Possibly so, and yet God is fair. God had something for Job at a higher plane than just easy living, a good life. A higher plane, one that will take him into eternity and beyond. A place in the hall of faith. All right, we move on. And the Almighty who has made me bitter, rightly so, you lose all your kids, your wealth, your health, 
you might have a tendency to be a little bitter inside. But not losing his faith, just a little bitter at life. Understandable. As long as my breath is still in me and the breath of God remains in my nostrils, my lips will not speak unjustly and my tongue will not utter deceit. I will never affirm that you are right. I will maintain my integrity until I die. Praise the Lord, good man Job. I will cling to my righteousness and never let it go. My conscience will not accuse me as long as I live. That is an awesome thing. And he can only say that because he has been tried. He's been faithful to God. He has is, he is set aside the pleasures of this life, the foolish things of this world. And he's endured. He's moved on. And yet, it's his faith in God that his righteousness is established. His pillar is, is the Son of God. And his conscience is clean. There's something about having a clean conscience. Sometimes you talk to people and pretty soon they're fiddling with their, they're squirreling around with their face and they're fidgeting. You go, what's the matter with you? You know, well, they have guilty. They have guilty, insecure conscience. There's something wrong. They haven't been totally honest. Something wrong. A clear conscience. You can look anybody in the eye and say, I will give you the answer to that, or I have a question for you, or yes, no, whatever it is that they're looking for. Something about a clean conscience that makes you free in Christ. Because faith in Christ can make you free and give you a clean conscience. Because you have nothing to hide. You've given it up. If you confess your sins to the Lord, to some of your close friends, and you're free. Somebody can't come up to you and say, hey, I remember when you were a teenager, you got drunk. I'd seen you drunk. You're no better than anybody. The Word of God says, if you say you have not sinned, you're a liar. And the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is a Christian knows he's sinned, admits he's sinned, and asks Jesus to forgive his sins so he can stop the sin and move on in maturity and and eternity in a relationship with his creator God, which is our destiny, our purpose, is to love God and enjoy him forever. Our foolish things that we did at our youth or maybe even in our adulthood, yes, we can admit that. A Christian admits that. But we also admit we need to be forgiven and to stop the sin. The godless, the wicked man, gets drunk every weekend and commits all types of immoral and and lies and cheats. And he feels no guilt because he's not trying to please God. He's trying to please himself. What can he get away with? The people in prison are not sad because they committed the crime. They're sad that they got caught. 99.9% of them, unfortunately. May my enemy be like the wicked and my opponent like the unjust. For what hope does the godless man have when he is cut off, when God takes away his life? I heard uh, some bishop, archduke, father of some pseudo-religious organization declaring there's no... There's no hell. Hi, son. Hi. This is this is this is my son. This is Canoe. He's it's kind of a he's a baby polar bear in Wisconsin, and he likes everything Daddy has. But anyway, I heard, I heard this little Guido Sarducci father priest thing with a collar on, declaring that that there's no hell. We don't need. To become Christians as a child, all types of foolish ideologies. And I could see clearly this man chose the liturgy of the clergy as an occupation. He was never born again, 
didn't spend his time reading the word of God or in prayer or repentance from sin. He was a hypocrite. That is like the ultimate blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. To study Christianity, preach it, but not living it. That is like the ultimate hypocrisy, the ultimate blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But these dudes that talk like that, they're very slick, very, they talk smart. So that kids that are in college can say, there's a lot of smart people here. They know better than Christianity and the Bible. The Bible is the epitome of knowledge and truth. To reject the Bible is to reject truth and knowledge. What hope does a religious priest or reverend or pastor that preaches a pseudo-truth when God takes away his life? I'll tell you what hope he has. None. He's going to, he's going to spend the rest of eternity in the lake of fire. And the fact that he preached there was no hell, when he gets there, he can convince all the people in hell. But it'll do him or nobody else any good because they're in the lake of fire and outer darkness forever and ever and ever because they rejected God's teaching. They have no hope. Once the grim reaper comes and or the angels... Angels escort you away to paradise, to the kingdom of God. That's a wonderful taking away. But when death comes to visit the godless man, the hypocrite, the sinner, no hope there, just a quick trip to the lake of fire. A, 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 a swift drop and a sudden stop to the lake of fire. <laughs> It's, it's brutal, but it's true. If you reject the truth, then there's no hope for you. No family member can convince you. No Bible teacher. If you reject the truth, there is no hope for you. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. If you live in sin and reject the truth, there's not much hope for you. You have to repent of your sin and admit you're a sinner and come to Christ and then obey him. Have some truth coming out of your pie hole, not flies. Okay, we move on. Will God hear his cry when distress comes on him? No, you rejected the truth. You said, there's no hell. You said, we don't have to come as children to Christ. We don't have to be born again. Not much hope for that man. Or woman. If you live in sin, your prayers are going nowhere. You might as well pray to a donkey. There's only one prayer if you're living in sin that God is going to hear is God, forgive me the sinner. I repent and put my trust in you. And then do so, follow through. God hears that prayer. Until that time, all the prayers for your neighbors and aunties and grandmas and your finances are going on deaf ears. This God does not hear sinners. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. It doesn't matter if you go to church every Sunday. If you're living in sin, practicing sin, God does not hear your prayers. No hope. Until there's repentance and faith in Christ, there's no hope. Will God hear his cry? When distress comes on him, will he delight in the Almighty? Will he call on God at all times? I will teach you about God's power. I will not conceal what the Almighty has planned. All of you have seen this for yourselves. Why do you keep up this empty talk? Sometimes people want to belabor and argue, argue a point over and over and over again, whether it's a Catholic priest or a Mormon minister or a Jehovah's Witness preacher or, you know, whatever. Or an Armstrong person. They want to start arguing about the law and keeping the feasts and, you know, a lot of rigmarole. Just get down to the bottom line. 
tell them, do you believe that Jesus is God? Is he the creator of the universe? Do you believe you must repent of your sins? Do you believe you must have faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross? And there's only one way, and that's through him, Jesus Christ. God come in the flesh. Get to the basics, the truth. Go through that door. Everything else will fall off like, like the chaff from a wheat harvest. Verse 13. This is a wicked man's lot from God, the inheritance, the ruthless, the ruthless receive from the Almighty. Even if his children increase, they are destined for the sword. Okay, I love you too. I love you too. But how many kisses? How many kisses do you need? Really? How many kisses do you need? Okay. Kanuti needs lots of kisses. All right, we can re we reboot here. Verse 14, even if his children increase, they are destined for the sword. His descendants will never have enough food. Those who survive him will be buried by the plague, yet their widows will not weep for them. The widows really didn't care for them. They weren't very quality people to be around. Though he piles up silver like dust, and heaps up a wardrobe like clay. He may heap it up, but the righteous will wear it, and the innocent will divide up his silver. The house he built is like a moth's cocoon, or a booth set up by a watchman. He lies down wealthy, but will do so no more. When he opens his eyes, it is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A storm wind sweeps him away at night. An east wind picks him up and he is gone. It carries him away from his place. It blasts at him without mercy. While he flees desperately from its grasps, it claps, it claps and clasps onto him, onto its hands, and scorns him from its place. Many a people, when they see that death comes on, they cry out to live they don't cry out to Jesus Christ for forgiveness. That was their last gasp. Don't be at that place, my friend, whoever you are. If you're family, friend, stranger, newcomer to the, to the bear's cave of discipline, wherever you're at now, if you're living good in Christ, cry out to him and tell him you love him. If you call yourself a Christian and you're living in sin, cry out to him for forgiveness. Make that cry. If you're just down and out, far from Christ, never really experiencing his forgiveness, cry out to him for salvation, to receive him, to love him, and to let him wash you. It's a wonderful beginning to a great work a great body and a great light that burns in little places all over the earth and it emanates truth the truth of Jesus Christ because we as Christians the little little faith that we have represents a little candy candle in my little bear's cave. There's probably a few Christians around here with their little candles burning. And throughout the earth, those little candles put off towards the heavens that God can see of his witnesses. And we are his witnesses. And that privilege we have as being witnesses for Christ will take us not only through this terra earth, this our time period here, will also bring us into the kingdom of heaven and will be with us forever that we were and are and always will be witnesses for Jesus Christ. God bless you, friends. From the book of Job, from Canute, from Mr. Bearpaw, God bless you, and we'll see you next time.